good afternoon, good uh, evening, good day, uh, dear Grinder, and thank you for joining us for this fireside chat uh, here in Luxembourg. Just a few housekeeping notes and some words about Startup Grind. Startup Grind, we are the largest community of startups, founders, innovators, and creators throughout the world. We have chapters throughout the world, and we see it as our mission to give companies everywhere the education and the opportunities they need to build, grow, and scale their companies. We believe in making friends, not only context. We believe in giving first, not only taking. And we believe in helping others before helping ourselves. And today, I'm very pleased that we have a fireside chatter who is also a binding to these uh, values and mission, especially the education part. But we will get into that uh, very quickly. But first, also thank you for our supporting partners, which are Boosted, BPM, Foxpeer, and Mixvoy. So now, without further ado, welcome, Patrick. Thank you very much, Steve. Great to be here. So, Patrick, in order just to kick it off, um, could you just tell us, really in a nutshell, in one or two sentences, what Inferential Futures is about? Yeah, sure. Uh, fundamentally, we think that the whole process through which young people make choices at an early stage of their education in terms of universities, uh, make choices about what they're going to do with their lives and find out what the opportunities are. That, that process is pretty broken right now. And on the other side of things, employers also find that the recruitment market for new talent, as they call it, the recruitment market is pretty broken as well. It's very fragmented. It's broken up into universities. and this is something that we're setting out to address with a series of tools and community and it's something that we think is really really ripe for change at this point in the 21st century okay thank you i mean that is what you where you are now but how did that come i mean you already touched a little bit on some of the pain points of some of the actors but how did did you get there and what made you trigger you also because it's not that you get up in the morning and say okay now i'm going to a little bit uh, innovate in the education and career world but how did that come what was the trigger for you to get into it okay so the i've i've been concerned uh, throughout my professional life with education and careers i was an academic at the university of southampton and um, the trigger for this really was somebody that stumbled across me online. Uh, my business partner in this is Ed, uh, who can't join us today. Ed's on the east coast of the US. And I was working on something. Uh, it was a uh, text to speech project, actually, going back a few years. We slapped up a website relating to that. Ed ran across that and made contact and we had some discussions about it and uh, he was very interested in it technically and then ed and i got talking about as you do you know uh we got talking about all kinds of things what interested us and so on ed's um an amazingly dynamic guy he's in his mid 70s had a whole career in technology hardware and software and is still enormously active um and we got talking at some point now i really can't remember what the trigger was for this particular discussion it was probably something that we read in the news or on social media but we were talking about the problems that young people have in finding a path through life in working out what they want to do and how that seems to be this would have been about five years ago uh how this seems to be something that is a a, a, um, a 
crisis is perhaps a bit too big a word for it, but it's a problem that many, many young and it's something that is getting more and more difficult as life gets more complex, as artificial intelligence comes on the horizon and starts to uh, offer all kinds of new opportunities, but is very disruptive in terms of careers. So we, we got talking about this and we said, well, maybe we should do something about this. Um, and so, I mean, the, the beauty of technology, of course, is it enables collaboration over large distances so one of us is sitting here um, in one time zone ed sits most of the year apart from a couple of weeks uh five hours behind me in florida um and we've always used skype for conversations so over a period of about nine months or so we had daily skype conversations fired each other off emails have you read this have you looked at that have you heard what so and so is saying and slowly we started to focus on the fact that we believe that um, there is an enormous amount of data out there relating to careers, the way in which the economy may be expected to change in the coming five, ten years, what job sectors are going to come into existence, what job sectors may grow, what job sectors may be threatened by technologies like artificial intelligence. So we thought, now, really, when you look at the kind of tools that are available to young people right now, and I'm talking principally about universities, careers, websites, and so on. So it's the tools that are available to support young people. They're really stuck very much in, maybe you'd say, the early part of this century. Uh, there's a lot of web-based material. But it's all presented in such a way that it's hard for young people to engage with. And the research that we've done, which is corroborate, corroborate, uh, corroborated by uh, academic research, is that in the UK, 50% of university students never, never, not once consult a careers advisor at university. And of the remaining half, uh, almost a third of those make one visit to the career service and that's it. And there's a number of reasons for that. Um, and I won't dig down into those for the moment. But it's pretty clear that from the student's perspective, finding a career is pretty, is pretty broken and a pretty fragmented process. And the encouragement for them from the universities is principally to find a job. Because the, the main metric, as far as the universities are concerned, is whether students on graduating have a job or find a job shortly after. That's a very, very important metric for universities because scrutiny by governments, uh, who are, after all, funding a lot of higher education, uh, scrutiny by governments demands that universities are making some kind of contribution to the economy as far as educating students and putting them into the workforce is concerned. The key term here is employability. Um, so it's pretty clear that young people find that a difficult process. And we were very keen to put together a set of tools that would enable young people to understand themselves better which is related to, for example, their personalities, the kind of people that they are, and the kind of career interests that they might possibly have that relate to kind of questions uh, about whether you're interested in a career that involves some kind of research and finding out stuff, or are you somebody that is more interested in a more, let's say, a more routine kind of job? Uh, so there's a number of dimensions that you can measure that way. And so we put together a set of tools that relate to that. And we put together a set of tools that enable you to explore data relating to, for example, what do, if you choose a particular career sector, what do the employment statistics look like as far as economic forecasts are concerned over the coming five to 10 years? Does it look as though that's a career area that's likely to be in demand? Or does it look as though that's a career area where demand may exceed supply and therefore you can expect 
but it might be difficult to make your way in that area. Um, so we put together all of those things. And then the final piece that came together, which we found very interesting, was through uh, a contact of mine uh, who put me in touch with a member of staff at the business school of Exeter University, where Michelle, as her name is, was carrying out PhD research into young people's decisions about careers. And Michelle built uh, an online platform for students to discuss careers and support each other in making careers decisions online. And this was very interesting. And the research that she did clearly shows that the outcomes from that kind of peer-led community are really very, very positive indeed. That, in fact, Michelle argues that potentially that kind of peer-led and peer-moderated uh, form of careers guidance has the potential to be far more effective than the traditional kind of university-led top-down approach. And I think there's a number of reasons for that which relate to Generation Z and the kind of people that they are. Our own research, which is carried out in focus groups and interviews, has shown that Gen Z are very keen to find out each other's opinions. They are very keen to have their ideas triangulated with others. And there is a very strong, let's call it a strong social ethic amongst them of contributing to a community and helping others. So when you bring those things together and then look at the other side of the coin, which is to say employers are looking for new talent. They're trying to find young people to join the workforce that will fit into their companies. They have the right skill set. They have the right knowledge. And increasingly, employers are talking about attitudes. And the Institute of Student Employers here in the UK, which is an interest group of employers who are concerned with early career talent, the Institute of Student Employers say that many employers are very interested in engaging with young people at a much earlier stage in their education in order to understand them better, in order to understand where the talent may lie, and in order to create a kind of seamless path between engaging with the students at university and then through to a kind of recruitment process, education process, selection process, onboarding process that enables them to find exactly the right people that they would like to employ. And um, at present, that's very hard for employers to do because recruitment is done essentially on a university by university basis so employers will go to a university they may go in some cases physically but they will make electronic resources available to students at that university as well and there may be online online engagement and if you have to do that there are in the uk there are upwards of 150 higher education institutions that provide degree level education for young people. We have Oxford, Cambridge and the others of the Russell Group universities, as they're called, which are regarded as the elite universities in the UK. And there are some employers who clearly like to recruit from that Russell Group of universities, a prestigious group, and have a track record of doing so but are beginning to recognize that in doing so, they are actually recruiting from a very limited pool of young people. And it's becoming hard to meet the requirements for diversity in their workforce. So there's a kind of 
Darwinian thing here, right, where employers are saying we recognize that we need to diversify our input stream, but the current recruitment model makes that very difficult. So it's a very compelling thing. Develop a community of young people who are actively engaged in understanding what they want to do with their lives, in seeking opportunities for further employment following university, and bringing employers into that mix who can not only see what's going on in that community, but can understand it by active participation in that community through mentoring, through online activities of different kinds. We ran, for example, just before Christmas, we ran a online webinar for one of the uh, big consulting companies here in the UK, which was related to technology consulting. And the message was very strong, but this technology, uh, this uh, consulting company was saying, we want more technology consultants in our business who come from a background that is not strictly technology. We want people that are engaged with and understand technology. But if, for example, you're a history, history or humanities student who is really excited by technology, we'd like to talk to you about the opportunities that there are with us in technology consulting. Now, the traditional recruitment practices as they operate at the moment don't make that easy. In fact, they make it very hard. So that's where we're seeking to bring together these two sides of the, the market, the companies that are recruiting and the students who are actively looking to understand what they want to do with their lives and are thinking about first opportunities after university. Thank you. And I mean, how did you go, your work referring to tools, how can one imagine these kinds of tools you have developed yeah, or John, designed? Yeah. Let's, let's, let's describe, let's describe um, a couple of things here. Um, one relates to knowing yourself better, which uh, when we started work on this, we thought that personality profiling would be a, a very interesting thing to make available. And in fact, there are a number of personality profiling tools that universities, some universities, offer to young people. Um, many people will have come across the MBTI uh, scheme, which uh, we, we don't find very useful or very compelling. After doing a lot of exploratory work, we decided that we would go with a profiling tool that relates to the big five personality profile, which is, um, I'm open to be taken to task by anyone who's watching this, um, which I think is could be regarded as a pretty scientific tool, pretty well validated, has five, five scales with a number of subscales, um, with the acronym OCEAN, O-C-E-A-N. Um, and so, for example, O refers to openness, how open you are to new relationships, new experiences, and so on. A refers to agreeableness. You know, are you an argumentative kind of person or are you somebody who is perhaps more of a, let's call it diplomat. So the personality profile is quite, interesting because there are a number of instruments out there that are very well validated but they all require you to uh, undertake a lengthy questionnaire the shortest of which is about 60 questions so the friction that's involved with engaging with something like that is pretty hard and we've spent a lot of time when we were working on this looking for ways alternative ways of personality profiling and we've tried a number of them um, and i think the the most reliable of which relates to a text-based interpretation of ocean or text generated so we take 600 words of text 
up to a thousand words of text, which is not, um, it's not your latest engineering assignment or something like that. It has to relate to writing. But we take a few hundred words of personal writing. And we started off with uh, IBM Watson as a tool for producing a big client profile from that. But that's been deprecated. That was deprecated about 18 months ago. So we've been using another tool, uh, an API from a third party that generates some pretty interesting uh, big five profiles from that. And from that, we can then, using an algorithm that we've developed from a personality profile, we can cross walk that to an interest, a career interest profile, which is another profiling scale. Um, this uses something called the Holland codes. And this is a six dimensional scale with the acronym RIOSEC. So R, for example, stands for uh, realistic. Are you somebody who would like to do a very practical kind of job? which might include lab work, but it might include more routine and mundane kinds of things. Or are you somebody who would prefer to do something that is perhaps more abstract? So we can, we can crosswalk from a personality profile into a RISEC profile. And then once we've done that, we can use that to reference other external databases that, for example, can make a list of career suggestions. And then if somebody exploring this wants to home in further, they can highlight uh, what the economic forecasts look like for careers in that area. They can explore what jobs are currently available in the UK, or they can narrow into a much smaller geographic area if they want to do that, and they can see what kinds of salaries are on offer. Um, so it's a it's a set of tools that relate to yourself and how that relates to the external world and what you might do with your life. OK, and we we had a great deal of fun. As we were on the sort of trial and development stage of things, developing all kinds of tools of a similar kind, I mean, da dashboards um once we developed uh, an online network platform we developed something that enables you to explore where in the network you have the, the strongest nodes what kinds of connections those are where you might want to work on your connections and develop further connections um, the possibilities are are enormous and it was it was actually at the point where um, we developed these tools and developed some fairly rudimentary front ends for them. I mean, everything is very unpolished and it's all held together with string and sealing wax. Looks a bit like the Wright brothers' first aircraft, if you if you know what I mean, right? In terms of an MVP. But um, we started trialing that with students um, just before COVID hit, um, and then we've had. We had about 18 months where students were finding it extremely hard to engage with anything because everything had switched online. Um, the universities were coping with different modes of teaching. So we spent that time very productively. The universities at that point offered us a lot of interns. So we've taken on interns from three universities here in, in, in the UK that enabled us to develop a deeper understanding of what we were trying to do. And now we've reached a point where uh, we're moving forward at the beginning of this year with uh, the bare bones of what we've developed to understand exactly what will engage young people and what it is about the tool, what it is about the tools that we've built that is provides the, the best value offer for them. Okay, thank you. And the other hand, I mean, I'm just uh, also taking the comments and questions uh, which come up. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are related a little bit to, oh, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it's interesting for 
university students or those who are becoming graduates in order to find themselves. Uh, the other thing is uh, a little bit, okay, the employers of the, today, are they already ready for such an approach? Or as you, you were also referring to, for example, for the big four horsemen and so on, for the big consultancies, that, uh, and also other companies, they have their, uh, how shall I say, their assessment uh, methods and processes, yeah. which are sometimes very rigid, just sometimes very, paper, I'm not, I'm not say paper-based, but evidence-based. Evidence-based, yeah. Yeah, academic evidence-based, not so much on the job training. So uh, how do you see that the employers are, uh, accepting or receiving? What is the reception you the, get? The reception from employers is, is, is very positive. And I think one of the, I mean, one of the pieces of evidence that I sometimes use when I'm talking to people about this is, is actually not a direct piece of evidence, but it's very strongly related to this. And this is the phenomenon in many, many companies now of reverse mentoring, where the, instead of the usual kind of mentoring relationship where you have a senior person or a more senior person who is being meant who is mentored mentoring a more junior person the relationship is actually flipped so that someone who is relatively senior in the company is mentored by somebody who is relatively junior very often somebody who is only in their in their mid-20s and the reasons that companies give for doing this are related to a need for the more senior person to understand the very different kind of values and mindset that this generation of young people and if they were in the, if they're in their early 20s that is the oldest of the gen z generation um, the very different values that these people bring, the different expectations that they have. And this is not about completely changing the company's values and expectations in order to align with those, but it's a research process to understand what does the company need to do and how does the company need to change in order to ensure that they are recruiting people who will stay with them in the long term and in order to ensure that the company is changing and evolving to fit a very different 21st century landscape. Um, and I think that's a very powerful piece of evidence to suggest. Now, clearly, the whole thing is a, a kind of bell-shaped curve, right? So on the extreme, you've got those companies that are really highly switched on to all of this stuff which are probably some of the bigger companies that devote more resources to recruiting, but they are recruiting many, many graduates from uh, across a range of disciplines and in a range of countries. Um, at the other extreme, you've got companies that are completely blind to this at the moment. They may be big, they may be small. Most likely they are the smaller and uh, smaller medium-sized companies. And the bulk in the middle who are looking for uh, guidance on this and are looking for ways of upping their recruitment game. So I think there is um, there there is a very high level of consciousness, I would say, amongst companies that the recruitment process is let's call it suboptimal. It could be argued that the recruitment process is completely broken because. At its most extreme, all it does is recruit people who are like us. In other words, who are people who are like people who are already employed in the company. And that's that's the problem. You know, you can think of this in Darwinian terms, you know, that, that companies have to evolve in order to survive. And they need a diversity of talent coming in in order that they give the greatest opportunity to get new ideas, new values, and evolve to fit a 21st century that's, I mean, the 21st century is beginning to look really different, isn't it, after the last few years? I mean, it really is changing. 
Um, we've got climate change, we've got the current geopolitical situation in Europe, and I would say um, we've, got, uh, we, 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 we've got the whole pandemic perspective that has changed the nature of working and people's and companies are all thinking about the way in which they onboard new talent continue to allow people some flexibility in their working arrangements but at the same time respect the needs of new talent coming into the com company for making new contacts in understanding company culture which in some cases might be better done in the office rather than working from home or working from Bali or wherever else you want to work from. Not a risk that uh, you, okay, you on board, but then that you only on board experts and that the companies are not evolving, that the companies eventually say, okay, this is the need we have, we on board, and then we have a little bit like you were touching upon on like-minded people. Mm -hmm. But how are companies then evolving? Uh, how do you make sure that companies also think about what are the skills they need in the future? Yeah, I mean that that's obviously that's not that's not the purpose of our business, right? Is we're not in business to educate companies, we're in business to help them to find the right talent and to help young people find a path in life. Um, but okay. I would I would say that, um, again, I don't want to harp on about Darwin, but, you know, this, this kind of idea that the fittest companies will survive, those companies that don't have the values that appeal to an incoming generation of young people who have some pretty strong opinions about the kinds of companies they want to do business with, the kinds of companies that they want to buy from, and particularly the kinds of companies that they might want to work for. Um, the companies that don't succeed in doing that will, will fail to prosper or will not do as well as they, as they could. Um, and I can see that from, uh, again, conversations we've had with employers, conversations with organisations like the Institute of Student Employers, where it's clear that the more uh, forward-thinking companies are looking to diversify the recruitment, the, the talent pool from which they're recruiting in all kinds of ways. And I mean, one of these relates to, um, you know, if you are a big law firm and you're looking for certain kinds of people. Okay, clearly they need to be qualified in some kind of way relating to law. You'll have some other recruitment requirements for the kind of people that you're looking for. Uh, historically, you have found that going to these five universities produces some pretty good quality people that you can say are worth your time looking. Now, in order to increase the pool of talent, you need to engage with, instead of five universities, you might say, well, we need to engage with 50 universities. Now, there isn't really an economy of scale here as far as that's concerned. Uh, engaging with five universities is pretty much a tenth of the effort, resource effort, in engaging with 50 universities. And you've got you might say some companies would look at this in terms of a law of diminishing returns, in terms of saying, well, as we get further from that original pool of five universities, we are going to be finding people who are very different and maybe the number of people to look at is, is so large that it makes it quite hard to find, you know, to find that needle in a haystack. But there's no doubt that there are people out there that they, they really should be looking at. I'm not talking about from a moral perspective, but you know, from a perspective of you will find people that could enhance your business and that being recruited by your business would add value. Um, 
you you therefore need something that enables you to uh, find those people much more easily than going on a, a you know a fishing expedition where the number of people that you're looking for are small in relation to the the pool as a whole so that's a you know that's that's i think is a crucial argument in terms of being able to aggregate the pool of talent into different talent pools relating to career interests and expertise and so on and then employers having having access to that uh, there's now some a question also a little bit i mean the topic is now relate a little bit to rated because you also have smes small companies stuff yes. on i mean our community mm -hmm. and uh, there were a few references uh, from uh, the viewers asking okay but that's fine if you're a corporate if you have eventually a structured process or if if yeah. you have a, eventually some experience that in the profiles you are looking for but how does on the early career advice how the, do you see that uh, for example a graduate a student uh, would be interested or should be interested by uh, how shall i say uh, a young company instead oh, of a you've, corporate? you've touched you've touched something that is so important to us and that's really interesting because as it happens um, I've done a number of talks for universities relating to uh, actually one of them was called why you should consider working in a startup as part of your internship or placement or first career activity okay yeah I think that's I, I think that's very interesting and there's a there's a whole kind of education process here because university uh, careers departments and employer engagement teams tell us that many young people discount the idea of working at a small company even if it, it, many of them have not considered it right because they think that rightly or wrongly they need a big name on their cv to start off with um and we've we've done a lot of work with with young people at university to understand what it what they're thinking about this is and it's clear that one of the one of the huge um benefits of working in a small company and particularly in a startup where you've got visionary founders involved is the opportunity first of all to feed off the energy and vision that those people have got and secondly to work in an environment which is permanently resource starved in terms of people so in other words in a startup there are always more things that you want to do than you can possibly do because you haven't got the staff to do it therefore if you are someone who goes into that environment it offers enormous possibilities in terms of your personal development the kinds of things that you can take on now th these things are hidden to most um to most young people at university it's not something that is apparent and i think that's perfectly fair because it, it really isn't necessarily terribly obvious unless you know something about startups and know something about young businesses so in fact one of the first things that we're tackling this year is engagement with the startup community we're not trying to make money out of them you know this is purely to understand how things would work at that end of the spectrum where you've got a company perhaps who's maybe got 15 20 25 employees is looking to take on somebody okay what are the needs of those employers and how can we help young people to consider if not careers then at least a placement opportunity or an internship opportunity in those kind of settings so absolutely this is this is really important and you know it's 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 um i haven't got the statistics in front of me but anyone that's familiar with the uh kind of demographics of companies i mean this is the uk but it will be true for any industrialized com country that you have a, a small number of very, very large monolithic national and international companies. You have 
a big mass in the middle of medium sized companies, but then you have a whole host of what we in the UK will call small and medium sized enterprises, where you've got a small number of employees, but the need for talent recruitment is just as high. It's just that for a startup, as, 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 as all of us know, that process of talent recruitment is a much uh, rawer kind of process than it would be for one of the big four firms, for example. So that's this is something very, very much that we think uh, we, we want to pay attention to. Thank you. And on the other hand, we are slightly touching the end, but uh, uh, just taking also the discussion and uh, the reflections which are coming up here and also what you approach uh, aboard it already is that's fine. But how do you see it evolve? I mean, you now have done it in the UK. Mm -hmm. And have you already some evidence for other countries? Or what are the next steps? How are you going? How are you now going about it in order to develop right. it further? Right. Well, what, what we understand is that um, what holds true for the UK holds true for other countries as well, to a, a, a greater or a lesser extent. Um, as an academic, I've had contacts with many universities throughout Europe, and there's nothing about my conversations with academics in those countries and their knowledge of students that suggests to me that there's anything different about the, the, the process there. Um, I wouldn't like to say that in the UK, the whole process of careers and of guidance is, is, is further ahead than it is in Europe. I think everything is pretty much the same. And I think the, true, the same is true. Ed's been looking at this in the US as well. Um, US is, is, is obviously a difficult market in terms of thinking about how you would tackle it because it's effectively a whole series of markets which are highly fragmented. Um, but we've had some very interesting conversations with um, employers in California who have certainly empathized with what we are what we're doing. Um, some the, the East Coast companies which relate to sort of banking and insurance and finance, yeah, for, for, for sure, the same kinds of issues. And in fact, I think the pressures on them, to diversify hiring are even greater and their processes are going to potentially undergo some very interesting changes in the way in which um, the whole equal opportunities landscape is kind of changing and the affirmative action la landscape in the US is changing where the whole thing looks as though it's going to have to become much more evidence-based. So I think the, the, the imperative for this kind of hiring process and this engagement of employers with, uh, with students at an early stage, I think, that's, I think that's going to come. About Asia and the Far East markets, I can say nothing whatsoever. But I think we would feel happy if we were able to extend what we're doing into the European into the European market more broadly, and to make a start in the US as well. So both of those are of great interest to us. Thank you very much, Patrick. And in order to wrap up, uh, as Startup Grind, we are the commu uh, community, and it's also about giving. So uh, what would uh, either in Luxembourg or a little bit in t on the other side, but uh, start with Luxembourg. What could start a grind in Luxembourg? All the members, or which kind of context are you looking for in order to develop your venture further? Oh, that's a really great uh, question. Um, for us, um, we've developed as a company based on the expertise that Ed and I have, which is broadly a combination. We both we both share the technology 
expertise. Um, we have between us a lot of academic and business experience. So it's a kind of, you know, it's that's that's a really great mix. Um, we're very interested in talking to people who are in the what I would call the HR space. As a business, we find it a little bit hard to sort of categorize ourselves in terms, you know, those drop down boxes that you get when you sign up for things. It says, what sector is your business in? Um, and I'm always torn between education or ed tech. And if it's there, I would generally choose human resources, HR, because this is much more about fitting round pegs into round holes than it is about education. And ed tech has that, still has that ring about kind of learning and resources and curriculum and teaching methods and so on, which this is not, this is not about. So um, I'm always, if there's anybody that is interested out there in talking about anything that we're doing from any of the perspectives, um, if there are any psychologists out there who are interested in talking about profiling, um, please do get in touch with me on LinkedIn. It's really easy to find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm the only Patrick Fullick there, so that's super easy. Um, to, do connect on LinkedIn, and you know, let's get a let's get some correspondence going. Let's email. Let's do a Zoom call or whatever, um, and we'll be really happy to have some conversations with you can see there are so many potential inputs here from the point of view of human resources, from the point of view of psychology, um, and all of the thing about motivation as well. Uh, what we haven't touched on today is um, there are a lot of young people that are very engaged with thinking about their careers and thinking about what they want to do with their life. There are plenty that are kind of worried about what they're going to do after university but that often comes second or third or eighth to the next assignment that's due in and what they're going to do with their friends at the weekend and their romantic relationships and all other kinds of things and i think one of the challenges for this technology but i think it's well up to it is to build something that provides um a companion for young people that helps them to figure out what they want to do with their lives and something that provides a compelling kind of engagement um, we would probably want to use the word gamification at this point in order to understand the kind of model for engagement that one wants to produce um, and that i think is actually quite easy to address in terms of the community and the benefits that accrue to the individual by contributing to the community and understanding what uh, what outcomes those contributions have had um i think it's very interesting sorry as, you, as i said to you before we started steve i can talk for hours about this stuff so please stop me but um, one of the things I do on, I, I, I'm a very active contributor to Reddit, uh, not under my own name. You would struggle to work out who I am on Reddit, but um, I contribute to a number of fora, uh, subreddits, which relate to universities, university students, careers, and so on. And the number of posts that I reply to or comment on that relate to making career decisions and how difficult it is and how the resources aren't available to help to do that are, are, are absolutely enormous. So that alone, and I, I'm not sure that Gen Z is a huge user of Reddit, to be honest, but I have no idea of the demographics. But I think that's pretty good evidence that there is, you know, there, there is a demand out there. These young people feel that they're not being well served by the present systems and certainly looking at it reasonably dispassionately as we did to begin with um it it, it does all look extremely early 21st century in terms of the kinds of expectations placed on young people okay thank you very much patrick uh 
I guess we we'll eventually we will have to have another fireside chat on that part. But <laughs> thank you for your time and your contribution. And, uh, hope uh, to look forward uh, to see you in Luxembourg and eventually to get the Luxembourgish market also adapting your vision. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Steve. See you in Luxembourg soon. Thank you.